Hi guys, Andy N, Spoken Label, back in the house. Thankfully, on a Sunday evening, it's a bit cooler now. It's been a very, very day today. England, as of typing, is in a heat wave. We are 28 degrees Friday, 29. Saturday, 30 today, and we've had heavy thunderstorms. So we're going across the seas, because I think I, this lady I've got with me today is in the Chicago area. She's told me some fascinating facts already about Chicago, which I most definitely didn't know. But I believe it's a bit, a bit cooler there. So we've got the fantastic... Margaret McLana. Margaret, we, you got in touch with me, didn't you, through a mutual friend of ours that's been on Spoken Label before. It was on yes. last year. And I forgot Mark, the name. Mark and uh, Mandy Elder are good friends of ours. That was it. Yeah, you mentioned me. And um, you got in touch with me, didn't you, originally? Um, you, 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 you publish it, wasn't it? Or you know, so you know someone that's been on Spoken Label before. And I forgot, and I've forgotten who it was now. I was all the apologies. <laughs> Yes. So, um, yeah, um, Mark, Mark is, uh, has conducted in Chicago. So we've seen him when he comes yeah. in for the uh, opera and for that was it. That was it yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah we'll talk about the before, Chicago Symphony Orchestra. That was, yeah. Cause people wonder if this gentleman in question, he, he's been doing the orchestra in the Halley Orchestra it was obviously the big, on the big one venue in the center of Manchester. The tremendous venue it is. I've been to some absolutely awesome classical concerts there. Uh, not seen we've been on it too. When we've yeah. been in town, we're like, we've got to see the Holly. You've yes. got to go to the Holly. Yeah, it's an incredible place. It's one of the. I think it's you get you get some gig venues, and you get this in Chicago as well. You will do straight away. Some you go to, you feel like you've been treated like a twelve-year-old child. But the heart where the Holly is, and it's at the Bridgewater. And it's it's a tremendously. You feel like you're treated like adults in there, and that's always good to me. Right. So, right. Anyway, listen, we're digressing completely. So now we're here today to what. To what Margaret, because Margaret here has got, she's got, literally, it's, I'm amazed when I was researching her because she's been in touch with me over two books. But researching her, I was astonished to see all her artwork. And the one that got me was a sculpture. But we'll talk about all that in a bit. Now, you're a busy lady because I want to learn, first of all, about your background. Because, like, I noticed, obviously, when you were, you started up with your creativity originally. And this was really interesting to me, this was. You're also you're a lifelong environmentalist now. So in relation to your creative background, did all this run hand in hand originally when you first got going? Yeah, early on when I was in grade school, I discovered um, mm. Silent Spring, uh, Rachel Carson's book, and mm. also um, uh, Jane Goodall. Um, so they triggered me studying science and mm. I was very interested in the environment at the time and also writing because they wrote so beautifully. They were just poetic in the way they described what happens if we wake up and there are no birds singing, you know? And so I really delved into both of those, writing a lot of poetry in, in grade, grade school and high school and uh, publishing with wherever I could the school uh, creative writing books annually or the magazines that came out. But also I'm from an artistic family. And so I was carving wood and modeling in clay. We lived on a cliff of Lake Michigan and there were veins of clay. Wow. Wow. So I actually got the clay out of the cliffs and there are piles of wood around from trees that were trimmed. And so that's how I started wood carving and um, modeling in clay. Wow. And along the way, uh, we went to France. My mother and I took me to mm. France when uh, I was in eighth grade. And we happened upon, after actually not happened upon, but we sought out Rodin's studio. Oh, whoa. I had oh, already whoa. done enough art that I was yeah. like, oh my God. I know what it feels like to be in the room with these people and they lived hundreds of years ago. How do you do this? Yeah. And so I wow. just decided I'm going to try that at home. Wow. Hey, one well, they always say, don't you? One thing led to another then basically, doesn't it? So incredible. Story. There you go. God, yeah, wow. So I'm no. actually at, at the Ragdale Foundation right now, um, oh, wow. which is where uh, that year Sylvia Shaw came to my house 
saw what I was working on and said, why don't you come and work with me? I think I was her only student. And she was a very accomplished sculptress at the time. And at the time I thought, well, how is it that you can have a family and be a sculptress and be a mother? And she made it seem very easy. She had two children. And so she was a great inspiration for me, as well as gave me a sense of the preciousness of life She's a very Quaker woman, a lot of peace and calm in her work. And I feel that I have some of that as well, where it's a spirituality or a feeling that I try and capture. I've done a little bit of artwork over the years, not to your level, <laughs> but it's, I think it's more for me with music, really. And I think it's the same applies to you, really, with this. Is when you're doing this sort of like sculpture work, and people should look at your website, but it's just absolutely tremendous. And like I was sat there thinking, my God, how do you do it? Like it's the patience of it, but it's the music for me to similar because you get into that zone, don't you? And it's like there's a calmness about it. I mean, just building it's like it's a lot of it, I think it's layer building really. Because I could I could do I do music when I'm composing to 40 layers on. Your sculpture's like thousands of layers on it. And and do you find that it's something you do your sculpture like it's you go into a world of your own, don't you? You must do. Yes, and it is for that zone where you get so concentrated, but it's an active concentration. Um, I think athletes get it, you know, playing yeah. soccer or skiing, where you you have to focus and yet you go deeper than thought. And yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. you know the sculpture is working. And a lot of times I come out of that and I'm like, wow, who did that? You know, it's yeah, a surprise what create what gets created out of it. And that's where we're getting connected to some universality. I don't totally understand it, but it is a connection with a flow of creativity and life and thoughts passing by. And um, if we are in our mode and we are making our art, those feelings and images come in. And uh, we become part of that universal Emerson idea of getting to a core. Yeah, oh, yeah. Connects you to so. everybody. Yeah, I do. I find as well, we have something, oh, we have to wait books. I wonder we have 10 minutes in there, not even got there yet. We will. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I find, and I don't know what your views are on this, so I get the thing you would agree with me in this. But like, I found I'm doing my music such a multi layered. I go into like, you feel like it's not you doing it sometimes. Like I'm a big believer in resurrection and that we lived before. And as when you're doing sculpture, I can well imagine it. You feel like you're channeling something, aren't you, in yourself? You don't even necessarily realize sometimes. Yes, it happens both in the sculpting, that channeling, and mm -hmm. especially in the writing. There were so many times that I read and did a lot of research and I'd be like, that's something that's important. And I would jot it down. And then I would go and look at one of my father's paintings. And I'm like, that's what he was painting. And I subliminally had it, or I have a DNA memory for it. And I realized along the way, if I don't write this down and have that visceral reaction, it could be lost in yeah. the next generation or the generation after. And, you know, a lot of what I was writing when you consider World War II, there is a trauma in it. And mm. supposedly trauma is traced in your DNA. And yeah, so definitely, certain definitely. things just literally I could feel in my spine when I re was researching different things. And yeah, along the yeah. way, I'd be over and over again, I was right on because I'd go deeper into reading or I'd find a letter that he wrote to my grandmother. And all of a sudden I'd be like, yeah, that's what I guessed. Yeah, that happened this. over and over again. Because these yeah. stories were told to us. I had to find them. I had to find it through interpreting his art, and I had to find it by reading Godzooks of books. And but yeah, in yeah. each one, I could tell what was important, and then I confirmed it. Yeah, I can relate to that because I want to go on to the books in a moment. So your you, dad is a crucial part to you as a person, as a writer, and an artist. Anyway, but it's on a quick point. You was like you wouldn't have known as well. My dad had an older brother that was killed in the Second World War. Oh, that, I'm so yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. I, I knew way before my time. And my, my dad barely knew him. My dad was about my dad was eight when he died. That's what he was. But like, oh. yeah, you get like it's that's something that's come up my writing quite a lot. 
and my dad is still finding pictures. I think his dad must have given dozens of pictures of his family. And he's been, my dad spent his life, but he's looking for traces of his brother. He never knew. He's like, mm-hmm. you do, don't you? It's like, it's something like that. That's what we heard about. You see, your dad really is, is your dad's a major impact on your work. Now, before we come on to that about your dad, I want to make sure we touch base because obviously we've hinted at this already as well. And I'm going to forget about this otherwise. I know what I'm like. Is, but obviously, you're like, I know you're an environmental journalist as well, aren't you? And we've touched on that to begin with. But tell us about the environmental journalism that you do then. Well, I think that came out of the Jane Goodall and Rachel Carson. I have an environmental journalism degree that I had to piece Mm. together by taking pre-med classes and literature classes Mm. at my school. They didn't, nobody thought about environmental journalism at the time. Now it's expanded to a lot of things. And from that, I worked with um, World Book Encyclopedia the year that the Jasons, an international group of science, Mm came together, they were atmospheric, oceanic, land, um, uh, climate, scientists all came together and they're like, this is 1979. They said, what happens if the ice caps melt? All of our predictions will exponentially increase and become a wild climate difference that nobody will really be able to handle. Well, we have seen that already. I tell you, we sent out the warning in 1979 and we said, we've got 30 years here to curb this carbon emissions because it, and aerosols too. Aerosols create these columns in the ocean in the North, Northern Ocean, and the Southern Ocean has consumed most of our carbon, warming it up and slowing down its flow. That's causing our weather that we suffer from every day and started talking about today. So I want to write about that as well, or it has to be my way, but as well as Jane Goodall or Rachel Carson, where it's beautiful and lyrical and people want to read it, even though the message that you're telling is really, we is urgent. It's an urgent message. So it's giving it a, a pathway in, to explaining it. Really? Yeah, I think you need to definitely nowadays with that. So good luck with that segment straight away. Now, I want to tell like 40. I want to make sure, well, I want to spend the bulk of this podcast today. And we took our time with it as well. That's me for you. So uh, it's, it's about the books you've done so far. Because to date, you've bought out four books. I've read two of them. And so we're, I'm going to have to talk, do the two that I've not read first of all, okay? Give people an idea. Now, obviously, first of all, then, tell us the about the young adult mini book you've done then about your coming of age in Chicago. I'm going to read Airdrie. So obviously so, I said that that's obviously a piece, gives people out about your background then before we go on about your father. Airdrie is about my growing up and becoming an environmentalist with two social justice parents. Um, we had three acres of woods around us and Lake Michigan. Wow. wow. But Lake Michigan you know, in, L wives were introduced to kill something else. And we had beaches filled with this spiny oh. foot cutting fish that wasn't native to Lake Michigan. Uh, we had a lot of pollution. Uh, the, um, there wasn't much care with that. So that was probably the impetus of my environmental concerns. Also, we had woods everywhere in Lake Forest, grand old oaks. And I watched them be cut down over and over again for houses, big houses. Um, and yet those in those houses, neighbors moved and I got to know more people. So that was really a strong dichotomy with me as well. Um, and uh, that grew to wilderness canoeing in high school and bird watching with friends and seeing the difference. And so it really escalated um, as eagles became nearly extinct. That is our national symbol. How can we let eagles become Mm. extinct? Great blue herons. Now, every time I see a great blue heron, I'm like, I remember when we almost couldn't show that to our children. We have killed so many buffalo. We don't even know if buffaloes exist anymore. They've been interbred with cows. And yet that also is a symbol on our nickel and has been my entire life. So how can the United States take these symbols that define us and allow them to go extinct? And that is by 
killing off the buffaloes right after the Civil War, just not even being concerned about uh, eating them or using their so those are just thought processes that I can't quite grasp. And those are the things that I've tried to write about, especially in this uh, young girl growing up in all of this affluence. You know, um, it's a dichotomy. Yeah, I think you need to do that as, as a writer, any side of things, because I've got my I've got a memoir myself on the way, but it's been a lot longer than yours. <laughs> but you do like it. I think you need let people see what, in your case, you've got a lot of stories to tell. I think it's a vital book for people to read for what I've read of it straight away. No, can't blame you there. Now, obviously, onto your father now, who, as I've said before, we've obviously talked about your father already. Now, I wanted you to tell us next about Mac and Irene, because I've not read this book yet either, but we'll go on to the other two in a moment. So, obviously, your father, as I'm reading on your website here, painter and artist reporter Franklin McMahon was a prisoner of war in World War II. Much of his web, much of his stories on his own website, franklinmacmillan.net. And obviously, I'm fascinated with this book. It's because it's based in scrapbooks, isn't it, from which your father kept. And so what made you want to do with this book? Then? Well, they did a lot of things when you have nine children at home. They went to mm. a lot of violent and um, uh, difficult situations like the Market Park riots that Martin Luther King said was the most violent and angry group of people. Mm. Uh, they were at the first Edmund Pettus bridge um, protest for voting rights for blacks. And it turned into a bloody massacre of people being clobbered in the head and um, people trying to get into churches and being uh, having firecrackers thrown through church windows to scare them. And so I wonder what is it, what is the, the drive for my parents to step into these scenes? And I, I thought that, they, well, World War II, they were both trained in World War II. And both of them were flying in airplanes that were uh, revolutionary. At the time, for instance, in Chicago, we had two Boeing airplanes in 1938 while they're graduating from high school. Both of them crashed within the year. So what does the United States do but order 50,000 of them? And wow. those airplanes are going to go overseas and help win this aerial war. So in Chicago, we went from two airplanes that didn't make it to 50,000 refueling, exchanging um, military equipment and air, and who wouldn't be fascinated to see this? But it was still a revolutionary uh, first generation of air traffic. And so both of them are flying in planes. Mom in the United States, uh, she's flying military around and equipment. And dad is now trained as a pilot with the Navy. And he's over in the big buildup in Molesworth, England. And when he's there, they are, he becomes a navigator in a group uh, that's a different battalion. And they fly over uh, Germany and drop bombs during the day. So okay. they're, they're targets. He did 16 missions before he was shot down. And uncovering that whole story also was something he never told me. He couldn't talk about it. He said it's better to leave it behind and I was taught as a child to just don't talk about World War II. Just if he brings it up, listen. But other than that. Um... Yeah, and I think it's very, very awkward. Because like, my father used my father served in the Korean War. And he's like, and I know he, he, he said there's a lot of stuff he's done in that war he was not proud of. And he, I know he's, we were growing up, I've got a brother and sister as well. And he, there's things he point blank wouldn't tell us about. It's just like it's having the war is trauma, you know. Like mm -hmm. that sort of thing he's gone through. There's too much you can't tell half the time. It hurts you, and you don't want to hurt your family, do you? Really, with it as well. So, yeah, I can understand you completely with that. Absolutely. Now, I don't think the mind can remember it accurately. I don't think yeah. our mind allows it. He does. I think your mind. That's what that's told me. Is that you're dead right with this. Is in that case, he's blocked it out. There's too much pain, and you don't want his family to be infected with that pain. Um, you, your dad, dad must have been the same with you and your siblings and that one, I'm guessing, straight away. Right. Um, and there was one time when I was in third grade, he opened up the scrapbook and started showing it to me. 
And I said, so is this anything like Hogan's Heroes? And he just said something like that and just closed it up. Like, how can he explain? Yeah. And, and uh, so that was the only time until my son was in middle school and a friend of his was interested in World War II. And I said, well, on half a day of school, let's go, let's go talk to dad about it. And he told those two boys everything. And I fortunately brought a video camera. Oh, I was video, wow. I was wow. videotaping everything he did wow. at that point. So that's the family record. And that is the spine of this book that I wrote. That gave me the clues to fill it out with more research. Wow, no, I can't blame you. No. I did add to, add to everything to it straight away with that. And my father's been showing me pictures recently of himself and a young man himself. It's a different world. No, I can match that world completely. Okay, I'm on to your other two books, the two I've read now. I'm going to do the longer book first, because this one I've been reading this afternoon and I finished off before. If trees could talk. Now, on your website, I'm going to, it's easy to read a little bit from your website, and then we can touch on it then. If Trees Could Talk is a hybrid historical fiction memoir that uncovers family secrets through the clues of Margaret's father's paintings and her mother's writing. I get yeah, now, I want to learn first of all about this. What made you want to do this? Because it's it's unorthodox what you've done here, but it's very, very fascinating. Thank you. Um I started researching it, not thinking of it as a book. I just had to find out what happened. Mm. And uh, for instance, uh, when I was an infant, my family moved to Spain, to Malaga Bay, uh, Torremolino, Spain. Well, who would take seven children pre preschool age with mm. an infant to Spain, to Franco, Spain in 1957? So as I start to build that out, I realized dad did get a job to paint in Morocco. So that was an impetus. Mom had loved to travel. And now she's realizing I may never get to travel again. But also McCarthyism was running rampant in Chicago. And the thought was that the Catholic Church was one of the places that most people were getting blacklisted. Dad and mom already had some of their friends blacklisted. Uh, for instance, that's when Studs Terkel went on radio, not television. Mm. Um, the film industry was hit hard. The creatives were hit hard. The um, uh, musicians, um, Pete Seeger was a friend of theirs. And he oh, was wow. Black. wow. So here dad has seven children and he can't not work. Um, so I think, and my brother confirmed it at a wedding that we moved to get certified non-communist because Franco didn't like communists. And living in Spain would be that kind of certification. And he was getting away from McCarthyism because he was pretty sure after having covered the Emmett Till trial for Life magazine, that he could be blacklisted. Mm. Two years previous, um, he, he uh, went down to Sumner, Mississippi to cover the trial of the boy who was um, abducted from his bed in the middle of the night and lynched by the Tallahassee River. I know, a 12 year old, 14 year old boy. I've, I've read a number of bad cases like that, and it's we've had similar cases in England over death penalty as well. It's just shocking. Anyway, I'll tell you about that on off oh, camera yeah, anyway. Yeah. yeah, I've got so stories comparing that. Yeah, you know, Mississippi, they got off, lived the rest of their lives. I was always remember, always remember the film, was it Mississippi Burning? One it with Gene Hackman and stuff, and but yeah. you know, that comes in a different, that's a different period in time, but yeah, that's because we're so I'm so far away. That is, the film itself is shocking to me, but you're nearer to the situation, so. Yeah, the film really tells the story uh, in a great visual way. Um, so anyway, that is the kind of thing they did all the time. And, uh, and we're compelled to do that and to draw attention to the social justice at different social justice issues that needed to be addressed. Um, housing, uh, protests. I just recently uh, had an exhibition and published a book called Resist, A Visual History of Protest. Which and ironically, we're coming on to that next, actually. So. Oh, sorry, <laughs> jumping ahead. No, 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 carry on, carry on. No, see, we'll carry on, yeah, but anyway, so yeah. <laughs> but it's 
50 years, starting in World War II, where the POWs that dad was um, in with were protesting the, uh, you know, the oppression that they were mm. in. Um, wow, they're getting along with the guards because nobody wants to be here. The guards don't want to. The POWs don't want to. So they're kind of having this uh, getting along, but then having a um, subversive um, uh, information source and mm. life. And um, that was evident in the Hogan's Heroes where they had the clandestine radio, um, where they hid things in the walls, um, where they had, were always trying to get away. And dad said, yeah, that was mm -hmm. what we were supposed to do, was always try and escape. And that kept them figuring things out and being creative and, and, and uh, uh, having a purpose. You have to have a purpose. So dad's purpose was to draw. And he had already been a cartoonist for Chicago Magazine. And so he sent his cartoons back from POW camp that were published. And that gave him a purpose and a centering in the middle of this kind of chaotic um, forced marches between three POW camps and adjusting at each camp. Incredible, incredible stuff. Now, I... I want to ask you a bit more about if trees will talk, then we're going to resist because resist is, is I've just talked it in the books if the trees will talk, definitely. Now, I was fascinated with trees talk, how you brought yourself into the book as well. And I've, I was really interested in the memories are like told in various viewpoints on this. Did you find them, um, did you ask each other like your siblings about the memories of this? Or did you just try to do oh, what, what evidence you had available in front of you? So um, I started with their story. And uh, it kind of turned into a, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. It, it didn't have the interest for the reader because mm. it was kind of a timeline. Yeah. So, and the thing that was interesting to me that I thought would be interesting for the reader is the discovery of it. Mm, yeah, the yeah. I got that. Error. Yeah, I yeah, got that. Yeah, and the, work, asking right? the questions and finding out just one more tidbit of a clue. And then I could I could open up a whole new other, another area of research. So by bringing myself into it and my discovery, that gave it a, a narrative arc that made yeah, it yeah. exciting. Yeah, definitely. And of definitely. course, World War II was the you know the climax moment of you know this is us and the discovery being built, and then discovering that, and then the rest of his life. Yeah, I think it's what I like about this book was it came across to me like you can argue it's like a detective novel. I think it's an emotional detective novel because, like, it's because you're so close to you, like, it's, you're investigating your own past, really, aren't you, through the clues you're in front of you. So, it really was it's a tremendous book. It's, it's a brave book to write as well. That's why. So, it it took it did take a lot of courage, yeah. I will say. I have That's eight seven. siblings. I'm sure everyone had an opinion, but also it gave me the clues. Like we played all these games as a child um, with parach parachuting little army men and learning to fly a, a plane. A couple of siblings became pilots. We were always playing capture the flag in the woods. Oh, wow. All of that was clues in plain sight. We were yeah. learning what dad's story was. Yeah, you can see it in the book. It's fascinating that one. So definitely that. So, okay. What then led you into writing Resistor? Well, Resist came out of that. And it felt like it to me, yeah. That, yeah. Um, the paintings that dad gave me when he passed away in 2012 informed me as to what he was doing while I was at school and growing up and, you know, going away to college. And I realized that this visual story had to be told. And so with each painting, I curated it to explain the timeline and what his interests were, what his thought processes were through 50 years. And that he took on um, affordable housing and gay rights and women's rights in the 50s and 60s, very early, um, and, and did drawings of meetings um, and then apartheid in South Africa and went to South Africa with a group of priests. Um, 
So it was uncovering, like the Emmett Till trial at the beginning of his career, this wrongdoing that people are getting away with and exposing it to the world through this lyrical, wonderfully drawn artwork. It's that he yeah. this in a way that was so enticing. It reminded me of going back to um, Rachel Carson. Beautiful writing to tell this, this story that has to be told and we have to adjust our behavior uh, based on it. And he was doing it similarly. Um, you also uh, work with words and music. And uh, I've recently done a sculpture of Gwen Gwendolyn Brooks. Talk oh, about just. Ooh, Boom. Yeah. Ooh. Right at you. You need yeah. to hear it. I'm going to tell it to you straight. I'm not softening any of the edges. But it's told with such a beautiful poetic way that you can handle it. That wow. is the art. Yeah, Making yeah, no. it, you can handle it, but tell the story straight. Yeah, no, I agree. She, gets, she cuts right to the bone every time. Oh, that, well, the resist does that to me straight away out of the two books. Looked, I did love the Trees of Talker because I'm, I'm glad I read that book first, aren't you? And then I might have to read Resist afterwards because Resist, people look at it, it's a much shorter book, but all the images and the photographs in it, they give so much colour to the book itself and it's it says so much. That's no, it's tremendous. That's why, because I I'm not, don't know a ton of American history, not, not as much British history, certainly. But you helped me out a lot by answering a lot of questions there, and you kept it. They all felt personal to you, but stories that everybody else that you could relate to were not great, great stuff. So now, starting to wrap up this podcast off, we're going to obviously part two. You're reading a few bits out for us. You were hinting to me, obviously, before we started the recording, that you're pitching around another book at the moment, aren't you, as well? So is there anything you want to reveal about this book? Uh, uh, if Trees Could Talk? No, no, or... no, beyond. You've got another book on the way. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, yeah, sorry. So <laughs> it's my English accent there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the next book is called How the Irish Built America. Ooh. And I'm looking at um, my 1830s um, relative, John McKillop, who is from mm. Northern Ireland. And he settled in the Adirondacks and built a democracy. Now, one of my driving mm -hmm. forces mm -hmm. with re writing this over the last few years is they built a democracy while they were cutting down trees to build the log cabin to live in and mm -hmm. milk the cows and, you know, get the horses to do this work and grow the oats. We have this scene here that's close to pre-Civil War United States, close to this 1840s time where we have such great divide. And I really wanted to dive in and said, we have been here as a nation before. We don't have the troubles they had, the hard work and the, the backbreaking, moving stones and building foundations. Hmm. But we do have the challenge of coming together and finding some kind of union with our great, um, our great divide in our nation. So I really looked into what it took to build a democracy. And already the United States had the constitution and which actually failed around this time um, and mm. was re reconstituted with after the civil war. But what it took to be coming out of Europe at that time and developing your own democracy in the middle of nowhere where you have no reference. You can read the Federalist Papers. You could read the newspapers. You could go into town, which took you a couple hours to go back and forth and hear what other people are doing. But really, each one of these settlements in the wilderness were creating a democracy. And it makes it more precious to think about it that way. And we are... The, the idea of democracy is that everybody is making it all the time. Everybody yeah. is part of the republic. Yeah, yeah, I'm very complete with that. What made you want, what made you want to do this book? Um, well, um, it is the last section of If Trees Could Talk, where um, I discover this family in, in the wilderness Adirondacks. And I could only skim off the top of it because ah. the book was already 
300 pages. So I wanted to do a deeper dive. And, yeah, no, and makes sense. Makes sense, yeah. There was makes so sense. much going on in 1850. I mean, just take 1850 as a year. It was just remarkable. And um, there's like, it's kind of like 1850, 1968. You could pick a few years where the world changes. 1919 is another one. Um, but just to capture this 1850 as the midpoint of this book um, was a marker for me. And what I guess I want to do is I'm discovering it and learning it. I want to write it and tell other people what I've learned. Yeah, no, you do. You, you two books I've read certainly do that one. You tell it in a very informative, personal way, indefinite. And bits of radio two books as well, so brilliant stuff. Now, we'll wrap up part one here, because I want to give you a chance to bit of reading for a spot. Do as I always say now, first of all, then. If you want people to find out more about you, where do you recommend they go first? To find out more about me? Yeah, more about you, yes. Um, well, my website, margomcmahon.com, talks a lot about my sculpture and my painting. I... um have been painting coral since mm. I've been following coral uh, half of my life, but I've been painting it recently because there's very few places that have super coral reefs mm. and the diversity and vibrancy and phantasmagoric coral um, I like to capture in painting because there's a little bit of a prayer motion with it, like prayer cloths where I'm painting it and trying to um, show other people its beauty, um, but also it's kind of a mantra, like we've got to save this coral because it's such an essential building block to everything in our ecosystem. Brilliant. I'll say if people wonder about your books, far, as far as I'm aware, they're on Amazon and aren't they so as well? You have to ask me one more time. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I think the, internet, I think the internet's lagging here. So, yeah, if people want to, you want to get people want to get hold of your books, is it best to go on Amazon? Well, you can go on Amazon if you um, aren't opposed to it. They all the books are there. Also, Bookshop.org helps out independent bookstores more. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but all the books are on Amazon and Bookshop.org, um, and they're published by Aquarius Press in Detroit. I have um, been had a very supportive relationship with Heather Buchanan there. Perfect. Sounds good to me then. So we'll wrap up part one. I want to give you plenty of time to do a bit of reading for us in the second half. It's been, I've really enjoyed this, Margaret. So thank you for this today. I'm looking forward to part two. We will see you all in two shakes of the dice.